Heavenly Father, as we open up the Bible now, we ask that your Holy Spirit will be amongst us. And as has been prayed already, Lord, that you'll speak to us. Lord, that something that's been said in the Word would echo with what you're saying to us in our hearts, that we might know, Lord, what you have to say to each one of us. For, Lord, we live our life in this time and space, and we know, Lord, that there is a time under heaven, Lord, for whatever you have. And, Lord, that the will of God be done. And, Lord, as Jesus taught us that he did the will of the Father, we ask that we will do his will and be in him as he is in the Father. And we ask as we open the Bible now, Lord, that we will realize that how precious our lives are, how precious life is. And, Lord, how precious your word is to us and direction and guidance to each one of us. So we pray, guide us, thou great Jehovah, as we open scripture now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. God is good all the time. Hallelujah. Now we have been looking through the Old Testament and seeing Christ in the Old Testament. And we have reached the book of Zephaniah in the Minor Prophets near the end of the Old Testament. And we will carry on with our study. We had a guest speaker last Sunday morning, but today we'll carry on with our study. Now, can I just take us back to Habakkuk? We did look at Habakkuk before uh, we had our guest speaker last week, and I just want to, to recap a little on that minor prophet which precedes Zephaniah chronologically in your Bible. Um, the word Habakkuk means a clinger, one who clings on, clings on. Praise God. I didn't say a clinging. <laughs> well, you get them in Star Wars, you know. But it's so ridiculous actually what's happening in our society, you know, they've actually listed that as an official religion, did you know that? That's how far our sense has got in this nation. People just say ridiculous things and um, the government capitulates and says, well, equality, equality, if that's your religion, and so we have all these listed religions, uh, such as the force and the uh, paganism, in a land that we sing as a national anthem, God save the Queen. There'll come a point we don't know what God we're talking about when we're asking that God to save the Queen because we've got so far away from the things of God. But the word Habakkuk means one who clings on, one who hangs on, who holds on in there. And the Lord himself tells us <clears throat> to hang on, to have faith. He even said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? And we're going to look at Zephaniah. And a lot of the minor prophets are all about hanging on, even when they go through times of tribulation, trial and judgment, of great ma magnitude, phenomenal magnitude. And we've lived in a nation which has been very protected. And we had prayers in the prayer meeting this morning for nations where Christians have been persecuted. Seriously persecuted, persecuted to death. Uh, we've got to cling on. And we'll cling on to things that are real. You know when the pressure comes. The stuff that doesn't matter. We let go. We let it go. And. Uh, I would to God that we did let a, th a lot of things go. Things that don't matter. You know one of the curses. In the church in the western world. Found within the church. Is materialism. Because we have been cushioned. From trusting God. Because we have had a welfare state, we've had more than enough, and we don't know what hunger is, we don't know what it is to go without. <clears throat> and we sometimes don't have faith, because we don't need it, we think. But ultimately, <clears throat> when we leave this life behind, it is by faith and living in Christ that we shall move on to be into the heavenly kingdom. So we need to cling on. <coughs> but the reason I've gone back to Habakkuk is that I want to clarify something. Excuse me, have a drink of water here. 
There was a point raised to me and I want to clarify it. We have been looking through the Old Testament and we have been identifying the Saviour. And of course, in many books he's very, very prominent. You don't need to look very far. Uh, if you look at Isaiah when it talks about the suffering servant. We know it's messianic. <clears throat> look at some of the Psalms and we see him crucified and his bones not been broken and we what we read even today about his, his garments being divided. We know it's a prophetic messianic promise, particular to Jesus Christ in person. But when we were looking at Habakkuk, it was uh, pointed out to me from the, I'll just put the verse up, uh, verse 13 of chapter 3. Uh, and Habakkuk, it talks about great judgment, but in the final chapter, in chapter 3, we get this hope that God is delivering his people even in the midst of all the trouble that's going to happen. There's a purpose. And the verse 13 it says, You came out to deliver your people to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot. With his own spear you pierced his head. When his warriors stormed out to scatter us, gloating as though about to devour the wretched who were in hiding. You trampled the sea with your horses, turning the great waters. Now, the point uh, that uh, was coming out was that in all of this activity, where the judgment of God was seriously falling on, on, on Jerusalem and Judah, the purposes of God were behind it all, and the purpose of God is made clear, is to save his anointed one. Now, the seed of David is being saved. To bring forth the anointed one, Jesus Christ, that was the point that was made. But just let me clarify, I know that some translations say you're anointed ones, and I want to look at some commentaries to just get the understanding. What we're talking about is the promise to David, that from David there would be this forever king, which of course is Jesus Christ, that in his people, uh, Abraham was told that uh, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And so when the promise is to Judah, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, we know is going to come. But it is talking about his people in this particular book. And uh, although it, it talks about the Anointed One, whether it says Anointed One or Anointed Ones, it is out of his people. And Jesus himself said to the women of Samaria, salvation is of the Jews, those of Judah. That's where salvation is going to come from. And so uh, I don't want to mislead you and, and make you think that this is a pre-incarnate statement about the Christ in actual in the final result when he was born of Mary but it is the seed of David that's going to, that is being protected uh, one Cambridge commentary if you don't mind the Shakespearean language it says uh, thou wentest forth thou art come forth for salvation with thine anointed it's amplified for the salvation deliverance of thine anointed and this commentator tells us that the, the term anointed was used in the Bible properly when they talked about the king, because they anointed the kings. We read that in 1 Samuel. And the priests, the priests were anointed with oil as a symbol of their position. And we read of the word later on being employed in a more general sense of the patriarch, those people who God's power was on for a purpose. And also... Psalm 105 talks about that, but in Isaiah we actually talk about Cyrus, a king who was coming to bring about the purposes of God, and he was called anointed. He was called anointed, but we know it was going to uh, bring back the deliverance of God's people, but this uh, King Cyrus. So, when we read it in this context, and we've been studying the Bible on Wednesdays, and we've been encouraged never take scriptures out of context what is the Bible actually saying not what is a verse saying if you take it out of context because you can get a different meaning in anything if you take it out of context and it's actually talking here it seems to be designating the people because it parallels with the preceding statement you came out to deliver your people to save your anointed one so it's paralleling with the people his people and so I just want to clear that up because I know that some people were confused when they maybe found a translation that said anointed ones. Matthew Henry's commentary. 
Again, it's a wee bit Shakespearean in his, because he lived a long time ago. All the power of nature are shaken, and the course of nature changed, but all is for salvation of God's own people. Even what seems least likely shall be made to work for their salvation. Hereby is given a type and figure of the redemption of the world by Jesus Christ. It is for salvation with thine anointed, Joshua, who led the armies of Israel. That was a figure of him whose name he bare. Because you know Joshua and Jesus is the same name. You know that, don't you? Even Jesus, who is our Joshua. In all the salvations wrought for them, God looked upon Christ the anointed and brought deliverances to pass by him. All the wonders done for Israel of old were nothing to that which was, was done when the Son of God suffered on the cross for the sins of his people. So that's the old commentator Matthew Henry on this verse showing us uh, that it oh, is all leading to the great salvation that God is going to bring through Christ. Praise God. I hope that helps. We're going to move on to Zephaniah. Now, <clears throat> Habakkuk means clinger. What does Zephaniah mean? Well, the word Zephaniah means the Lord has concealed. Uh, hi hidden in his name is the concept of being hidden. And thank God the Bible says our lives are hidden with Christ and God. Praise God. Are you, are you glad of that? That we are hidden in Christ with God. We are in a, a safe place, a special place with God. But he says, touch not my anointed, and I do my prophets no harm. When God looks upon us, he sees the apple of his eye. He sees we have a special place with God, because we have been purchased by him. And we, we, we are owned by him, we belong to him. And uh, the word Zephaniah means the, the one that's concealed or hidden or, or protected, or treasured by God, a hidden treasure. And in fact... When we begin to this book, it's a short book, I hope you've read it, or maybe read it after the service. It starts to talk about the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord! And, of course, its implications for his hidden ones, his hidden ones. So, the book of Zephaniah, what's it all about? Well, Zephaniah prophesied during the reign of Josiah. You know about Josiah, he did try to put reforms in place. You know about all the wicked kings. Although God was preserving the seed of David to bring forth the Christ, it, it came through a very strange route. Not all of the kings were good kings. In fact, most of them were bad kings. Uh, and he prophesied that would be about 640 to 609 BC. Habakkuk would have been in the middle of the 7th century. So he'd be a wee bit earlier. And so he's prophesying. And he introduces himself, we know nothing about him other than his name Zephaniah, but we know a wee bit about his chronological uh, birthright because he was, he's actually of royal blood. Now some of the prophets were shepherds and all sorts of people, but this fella was descended from a king because he gives us his, uh, his, who his great-grandfather great was. In chapter 1, verse 1, son of Cushi, and then he gives the others, and he traces himself back to his great-great-grandfather, Hezekiah. Hezekiah. Remember Hezekiah? We talked about him quite recently. Uh, how Isaiah went to see him and different things. And Hezekiah had 15 years added to his life. And uh, he prom he's very prominent in the Old Testament. So this Hezekiah, he highlights his lineage back to one of Judah's good kings. I don't know why he doesn't trace it right back, because he could trace it right back. If he can go as far as back as Hezekiah, he can trace it right back, just like we have in the genealogy we have read in Matthew and, and in Luke. But he doesn't. He stops at a good king. Maybe he doesn't want to, to go back into all the soiled water, the muddy waters that the other kings have done, but he stops at a good king. He was the great-great-grandson of a very good king in Judah. Praise God for that. So... He talks about the day of the Lord, and by the way, it's very fierce. It's an incredible judgment. It's very, very fierce, and it's comprehensive. It's not just to do with Judah and the enemies around about. It's to do with the whole wide world. The whole wide world is going to be judged the day of the Lord. Hey. And the judgment is nearing. And there's a picture of the day of the Lord. And it consumed the whole wide world. And it will be upon Judah and Jerusalem as well. We read that in chapter 1. 
Praise God. In chapter 2, we'll just read a wee bit of it. I'll put it up on the screen. Verse 1 to 3. Gather together, gather yourselves together, you shameful nation. Praise God, we say in Glasgow, pull yourself together, pull yourself together, okay? And we need to tell people, get real man. It's time we woke people up. Get real man. Pull yourself together here. Something bad's going to happen. You better get hidden and get out of the road yet. Before the decree takes effect, and that day passes like wind-blown chaff, before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's wrath comes upon you, Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, you who do what he commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you will be sheltered, perhaps, on the day of the Lord's anger. Perhaps you'll be sheltered. So you see this idea of the hidden one finding a safe place of refuge when all of the wrath of God is going to be poured out in a wicked world. Listen, God's not going to endure sin forever. Do you think God's going to put up with sin forever? Do you think so? Zephaniah didn't. He says, God's going to deal with us in finality. He says, you people are humble and get righteous. And he says, seek the Lord and perhaps you'll find a shelter when all this happens. So that's what he says. So, let's move on a wee bit. Gather together, gather yourselves together, you shameful nation, before the degree takes effect and that day passes like windblown chaff. So, Zephaniah is talking about coming judgment. God is announcing to Judah the approaching day of the Lord. And they're told to seek the Lord, all the humble of his land. So there'll be judgment upon the surrounding nations. We read that in chapter 2, verse 4 to 15. But it ends in chapter 3, if we read 1 to 20 of chapter 3, that the Lord's work is in the midst. God is at work in all this judgment. And it ends with the work of the Lord. So we read in chapter 3, which is thank God for chapter 3, because chapter 1 and 2 is very severe. His justice, shameless Jerusalem, is punished. Isn't it terrible how there's no shame? People are not ashamed anymore. There's no such a thing. They do the most foul and filthy things and they have no shame. And God said, shameless Jerusalem will be punished. So we start with justice. Then it moves on, chapter 8. It's chapter, verse 8 of chapter 3 is purging so there is a waiting remnant there are people who are expecting God to do something these humble they get purified the shameless get punished and the waiting remnant are purged and purified and then it moves on from verse 14 to 20 and it goes on about his rest there's a rest and there's a hidden treasure. Thank God the bride of Christ is a hidden treasure. Amen. Amen. We are his treasure. And the hidden treasure ends rejoicing. Praise God for the rejoicing that comes about. Chapter 3, let's have a look at it. Sing, daughter Zion. Shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord your God is with you. The mighty warrior who saves, he will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. At that time I will deal with all who oppressed you. I will rescue the lame. I will gather the exiles. I will give them praise and honor in every land where they have suffered shame. At that time I will gather you. At that time I will bring you home. I will give you honour and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore <clears throat> your fortunes. Before your very eyes, says the Lord. Praise God. You know we sing that chorus, give him honour and praise, don't we? 
You get that in context. It's not we're not giving God honor and praise. God is giving his people honor and praise. Did you read that? That's why it's so important to get context. He's going to bring out a treasure that are going to sing. And he's going to bring them from everywhere, from all of the land. So we're what is happening here? Who is actually going to perform this marvellous work on behalf of Israel? Who is it? Well, it's none other than the one who has the right to reign. It's God's anointed. The Lord Jesus Christ is the one who will bring this prophecy to pass. The Son of Man is coming to judge. We read that in the New Testament. He's given it of his Father. In fact, can we read on? In the New Testament. Let's look at it. Acts 17. When the gospel message got out amongst the people. Starting with the Jews. We read. Because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. By a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by him. By him raising him from the dead. Jesus Christ. Is the one who will judge the world in righteousness. Because he has been anointed. So when we read in Zephaniah this wonderful hope. It is the Lord Jesus Christ who will bring this to pass. Peter. In the second Peter. Chapter 3. He says. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. And he's talking about the elements. He's talking about the world. What manner of persons ought you, you to be in, in all heavy, holy living and godliness? Looking far and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, in which the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. What kind of people should we be knowing that the future is facing judgment? The Bible said, you know, the, the, the homosexuals have stolen the rainbow, They've stole it because the rainbow belonged to God. God gave it to the world as a promise. And he attached a message to the rainbow. Not the message that the imposter is attaching to it. Because he is an imposter. But the devil is taking what God has given. And that's what he does. And he perverts it. You know, when God gave a word to Adam and Eve, the devil perverted it. He said, thou shalt not surely die. But die they did. And God said he would never destroy the world by floods again. But there's going to be a cataclysmic judgment of God by fire. And we, we read in the, <clears throat> the understanding of the first preachers of the gospel that the day of the Lord would come and they knew the scriptures. And knowing that this is going to come and when you read a book like Zephaniah, read the chapters and just read what is actually going to happen. What kind of people should we be? Should we be putting our tents down here? Should we be making our bed down here? Should we? We used to sing a wee song. In fact, I sung it round the grave of the guy that led me to the Lord. He wrote a wee chorus to it. Heaven's my home. Heaven's my home. I've got nothing down here. Heaven is my home. But there's a lot of people that have got everything down here. But if you know it's going to be destroyed, if you know like in some countries just now, they go home and their home is no longer there. It's been hit by a missile or whatever because of war. You know, when you actually think about the Bible, it's phenomenal. When this was written, mankind didn't have the power to do this sort of thing. To destroy the world by fire with the elements melting. What happens when a nuclear bomb goes off? The elements melt. They are no more. They're dissolved. They didn't have that power, but they do now. Trump came home empty-handed the other day from North Korea. No, the wee man wants to keep his nuclear missiles. India and Pakistan fighting with each other. Both of them have got nuclear missiles. They've got the power to dissolve the elements in their hands, but they push you a button. We think it'll never happen. We think CND's won. The world will never see a cataclysmic end read your bible but thank god that people can be hidden hidden by god from the outcomes of god 
finally dealing in judgment with a world which has spat in his face and totally rejected him. Is that right? And so this book, it teaches us and it preaches to us what should we be. It actually asks us questions as Christians. I feel judged this morning when I read this book, personally. Peter's telling me, what kind of person should you be? You know this is going to happen. You know what's in front of your land. You know what's in front of the world. You know that God's not going to let this go on forever. What kind of person should you be? Well, First John, and we read that last week on Wednesday there. He said, this is an old man, but a special old man, a man who leaned on the breast of Christ. We read some of his writings today. In fact, we read from the Gospel of John. And he had an insight into who Christ really is. Some of the disciples were trying to make their mind up. It looked like uh, Judas got it totally wrong. Peter, he got excited. They were wanting the kingdom of God. But you know, John, he had an insight. And as an old man, he knew something about the depth and the length and the breadth of the love of God. And he te- teaches us. Let's encourage one another to live in the light of Christ's imminent return. Amen. Amen. And now little children abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. What is John saying here? We have to live in the light of his imminent returning, because when he comes, what kind of position is he to find us in? He could come today. Jesus Christ could come today. Have you stopped thinking about that? A lot of churches never talk about the return of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said he would return. Now if he were to return, what kind of confidence would we have? Would we shrink back from it? Would we feel, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. What kind of confidence would we have if Jesus Christ was coming today? He says abide in him. Live in him. And this is the only security we have to be hidden. And that's what Zephaniah is all about, being hidden and being his treasure, is to remain living every day of every day of our life in Jesus Christ. Not living in the flesh. We live in the flesh. We will come into sin. And we learned on Wednesday that the letters of John is to do with the question of Christian sinning. What does it mean? It's a serious thing when Christians sin. But we have to abide in Christ and we have to be ready for him coming. If we got the word is coming tomorrow, what would we be doing from now till tomorrow? Praise God. The Bible is giving us light as his hidden ones. Praise God for that. So let's ask the questions then, shall we, in closing our service this morning. The question we need to ask ourselves is, am I looking forward to the Lord's return or am I frightened about it? Am I ready for Jesus coming back? If I'm frightened, that worries me that Jesus might come back. What's what's causing me fear? What is it that's upset me about him coming back? With some people, they want to play with sin a little bit longer. Because when God comes back and the day the Lord comes, He will be removing sin from the world forever. There will be no sin to play with anymore. And some people want to hang on. We are talking about Habakkuk, who's a hanger-on, but he's hanging on to God. Some people want to hang on to the sins of the flesh, or the sins of the world, or the pride of life. But John, that old man, that old godly man, he says that we should be ready for Christ coming back, and we should be abiding in him. And if that is the question, if there's something we're hanging on to and we're not fulfilling our purpose in God because we're hanging on to something, what is it that makes that so attractive? What makes sinful behaviour so attractive? And what will you take your confidence in in the coming day of judgement? You you need to ask people, if you died tonight, would you go to heaven? If they said they think they would, you say, well, why do you think you would? What do you take confidence in for your eternal security? Thank God for the blood of Christ. For it is God's answer to judgment for us. So we're 
questioning our own relationship with Christ because at the end of the day it's nothing to do with Jim McLaughlin, the pastor, or Springburn AOG Church, or Glasgow, or Scotland, or the world. It's to do with you and God. You and God, each one of us. We have to ensure our relationship with our God is secure in Him. But through Christ, we should be growing deeper with Him instead of growing apart. Some people grow apart and they lose their fervor, they lose their first love. And what is causing this? We need to ask serious questions. When you read the book of Zephaniah, it asks serious questions that we might be, be and remain in the safety of the hiding place of Christ. Praise God. We're going to close our service and we're going to sing a wee hymn that kind of gives you this thought that we're in the Lord's hand. Jesus use me. Oh Lord, don't refuse me. We're living in a sad, sad world. Let's go to this place saying, God, what can I do for you today? Is there someday I can bring to the gospel meeting and they'll get saved and they'll go to heaven? Surely you know somebody that's not saved. Is there somebody you're telling me to write to, to phone? Is there somebody that you're putting in my heart that I can minister life to? Each one should bring one, one heart at a time. Praise God. We are living stones. Hallelujah. We'll sing this and uh, we'll uplift the Lord's offering if we close our service. It's a song of commitment. Hallelujah. Jesus gives me all of
Come at the end of the service, we'll pray with you. Lord.